All right, welcome everybody to Fit Foot You. This is Dr. Ben Pearl. And tonight I have a real treat. It's uh, an old friend and my ski mentor, Tom Reifert. Tom is a former professional ski racer. He has uh, been director at uh, Whitetail where I skied for a bit and worked under him. He is uh, management of commerce for the uh, Baltimore and, and the state of Maryland. He's gonna talk mostly about his ski career and he had one evil can evil kind of injury that through his perseverance he was able to get through. So uh, welcome, Tom. Well, uh, thank you very much, Dr. Ben. I appreciate it. And uh, it's, it's good to be here. Um, yes, it's true. I am the Assistant Secretary of the Maryland Department of Commerce, and I'm in charge of uh, tourism, film, the arts, marketing and communications, and the Maryland Marketing Partnership for the state of Maryland. And uh, I started ski teaching in 1980-81 ski season up in New York State at a little mountain called Greek Peak. And uh, I was going to Cornell University at the time and uh, skiing became a big part of everything I did in a sort of career path for the next 40 years. And I was uh, brought down to Whitetail by my good friend Ron Hawks, who was our ski school director uh, in 1991 when Whitetail started. And I took the job as being the assistant ski school director and also the technical director in charge of all of the training and that kind of thing. And you were and then, trying to make it like a Deer Valley kind of a place there, I guess, or not you, but the, the vision of the ownership, right? At the time. Yeah, when we, when we started Whitetail uh, and it was under construction and 1991, it was a $32 million project. So if you think about that, that's a great deal of money for 31 years ago. It was a, just a tremendously uh, expensive project. It was a great lodge. It was designed by the same architect that designed the, the, uh, the lodge at, uh, at Deer Valley. It was uh, the same uh, engineering uh, team, Snow Engineering, that designed all of the great trails of Beaver Creek and a lot of famous uh, ski areas around the country. Um, and it was fun to go from zero ski teachers to uh, you know what we had that first year, about 140. And uh, then we grew over time. And right now Whitetail has 360 ski teachers last time I checked. Uh, so I've been involved in the, in the ski biz for a long time. And then what this sort of evil Knievel thing you're talking about, uh, what that's all about is there was a great national effort uh, and it was called the Jimmy Huga Express that uh, was a fundraiser to help fight multiple sclerosis that Jimmy Huga had. Jimmy had been on the US ski team. Uh, he was a medalist in the Olympics. Um, he was a great ski racer and he started getting tired and he noticed that he just wasn't as competitive and finally he was, was diagnosed. And he was told to stay in a wheelchair, uh, basically, and, and, and sort of give up on doing anything. And what happened uh, was that after a few years, he just couldn't stand it. And he said, no, I'm going to go out fighting. So he began cycling and he got actually skiing again well enough to, to ski. And he, and he held these fundraising events all across the country. And we had one at Whitetail in 1994. And that was our first uh, Jimmy Huga Express giant fundraiser. And what it was, was a four hour skiing marathon where uh, you get a, a team together, usually four people, and you uh, both are competing as an individual, but also as a team. And you try to ski as many runs in four hours as you can. And we're talking speed suits, uh, very long skis, the whole bit. And that was the year that I set the record uh, for the most vertical feet skied in four hours. And it was 44,880 vertical feet. Uh, at Whitetail, that was 48 runs in four hours. And what we had done is we, at Whitetail, there's a high speed detachable quad and the usual rope speed of that is about 900 or so linear feet per minute. It's a 3,300 foot long lift. And we had figured out how to bypass the safety switch on that and, uh, and generate more speed out of it. We had it up to about 1,100, 1,200 linear feet per minute. And 
I was doing laps, you know, every uh, uh, four minutes. I did 48 runs in, in four hours, which was a record that 44,880 vertical feet in four hours held up for several years. Finally, somebody can you, uh, broke can it. Can you give us an idea about how many miles per hour you were, you were smoking down the hill? Well, they had estimated that I was going in excess of uh, 60 miles an hour. And there are a lot of people going at least that fast also, uh, because I squeaked by and, and, and was only one run ahead of somebody uh, uh, who finished uh, second. And then, uh, you know, so, so that was a, kind of neat. The record held up for a long time. Somebody beat it up at Hunter Mountain, which is a, about a 1500 foot vertical. And they also have a high speed uh, detachable lift. And uh, so they, they were able to beat that record, but it was in skiing magazine and that kind of thing. Now turn the page. The next year, in 1995, on March 3rd, we held the event again. And instead of it being just perfect weather, it was warm. I think uh, when we opened the lift that day, it was probably about 45 degrees and got warmer by the time we started the event. And uh, about two hours into the four hour skiing marathon, I was pushing really hard. And the, uh, the place where you come down to the bottom of the trail and you make the turn to head back to the lift, uh, there was quite a divot, uh, quite, a, quite, a, quite a bumpy dip that, that had formed there where a lot of people were doing the same sort of turn. And what happened is my right ski came off my foot at about 50 or so miles an hour. And I went flying through the air and smashed into the uh, large fence at the bottom of the, of the hill. It was a four by four uh, post that my right leg wrapped around and I carried through the fence and uh, went another 90 feet or so bouncing among rocks and trees. I broke a total of 11 bones and uh, all eight ribs front and back uh, broke my right shoulder blade in three pieces. Uh, I broke my right leg in 10 pieces, my tibia and fibula just above ankle, just about what you and I would call boot top high, uh, was, 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 was broken my leg. I don't know if you can see it, but it was kind of like this, yeah. you know, it was in a, it was in a V shape and, uh, both lungs collapsed, lacerated my liver, uh, squished my gallbladder had one heck of a concussion. Uh, my brain pan really uh, sloshed my brain around. And uh, the, the major issues uh, included I wasn't able to breathe very well and uh, that I was losing a lot of blood internally. They, uh, the, the ski patrol folks all worked together with the, the mountain operations folks. They got me belayed up out of the sort of the deep uh, to call it a ravine, it's kind of true. At the time, the fence is, was in a different place, Ben, than what it is today. But, um, uh, it, it, you know, 90 feet, they had to get me up there on a backboard and out through the fence and then get me loaded up onto a, a, the back of a, a, a snowmobile sled thing and got me down to the bottom and loaded me immediately into an um, ambulance and drove me to the Washington County Hospital, which uh, was in Hagerstown. Um, and the trauma team met me there and it began quite a number of operations and, uh, keeping me around, you know, they had to do a uh, pneumothorax to try to get my lung to, uh, reinflate my lungs to reinflate and, uh, a lot of uh, orthopedic, uh, uh yeah, yeah. Did procedures. You ex- did you have an external fixator on that leg? Like an external uh, director set kind of a thing? The, the orthopedic surgeon, um, uh, had uh, put in a, a steel, a non-rim steel rod in the tibia and had to thread it through. Uh, and, and then there are some screws and there was this thing, I don't know what to call it, but like a halo uh, is what it, it, around it for, for uh, a couple that's of a, weeks. That's a Russian, that's Il- Ilazarov technique. It's an external fixator. So fixator. it's like an external erect- erector set. That, uh, like an erector set. Yeah. Yeah. And it, it, it came off, uh, after two weeks, I was in intensive care for a couple of weeks and that's when it came off. And it's funny because um, the accident, the crash happened in uh, March 3rd. 
And I came back to Whitetail on March 17th for the end of the year ski school party in a wheelchair. And uh, which was, I, I probably shouldn't have done that, but, but uh, I had people drive me. I wasn't driving. But I, I spent a lot of days uh, following that, obviously, in bed. Um, and it was a good uh, two months before I could really walk again with a uh, walker and get around. And then I quickly graduated uh, to a cane. And then it was about a little bit less than a year that I tried skiing again. Did you and think at, the, at the, the, you know, one to two weeks after that you'd be skiing again? Uh, they told me I wasn't going to walk again, uh, the, the, normally. And, yeah, and right. no, no right. way was I going to be able to ski again. What had happened is I lost... Um, I think you would call it in your world, primary articulation of the right uh, ankle. I was unable to do sort of uh, appropriate dorsiflex and I could not uh, um, uh, uh, supinate well to the little toe side and had no feeling in um, the second, third and fourth toes for months. There's a lot of soft tissue damage down there. And pronating was very, very difficult. So um, I had uh, obviously a week um, able to articulate left and right of the rotary motion from the knee on down. It took me a long time. And when I did take a couple of runs, it was not in Alpine equipment because I couldn't get an Alpine boot on. I had these low um, telemark boots that uh, sure. were the leather real soft boots that laced up very low below the break point and I was able to get down a hill and kind of make a few turns but Ben to be honest with you it was several years before I ever put on an alpine boot again and I was out of ski teaching uh, uh, for uh, uh, about six or seven years unable to really get it together and the ski school director Mac Jackson uh, had contacted me because they were starting at Whitetail a um, uh, this thing called the Two Top Mountain Adaptive Sports Foundation, a nonprofit right. to help folks with various abilities. Uh, and 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 it was there was a real need for it. They needed equipment. They needed to be able to raise money to purchase the equipment. They needed to be able to have donors who, if they donated, could get tax breaks or tax uh, 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 donation credit, that kind of thing. So I agreed to help uh, start it. We, we set up a program where in Hagerstown, uh, those people that participated in the program got free hotel rooms on the weekends. They didn't have to pay for a lift ticket at all. None of their equipment they had to pay for. Everything was free, including the food. And if their family needed to come, the family came for free also. And it's a great program, and it still exists today. So and, uh, Bill, you, Bill's, uh, Bill's kind of the point person up there. Bill Dietrich still, right? That's correct, uh, yeah. Uncle Bill Dietrich. He uh, looks like Santa, yeah. uh, but he he is the executive director, and they have an interesting arrangement with the um, the orthopedic unit at uh, at the Navy Hospital in Bethesda. Um, at, 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 at that, uh, you know, that hospital there that gets all of these folks that over the time of uh, the war in Afghanistan and Iraq, there's a lot of people that were coming through that hospital, people missing limbs, that kind of thing. And a lot of them came through Whitetail that, through that wonderful program. So anyway, we had, we had our first meeting about that. I'm trying to remember what year it was, but um, Mac Jackson, the ski school director at the time, says, Tom, you know, I see you skiing around every once in a while in Telemark here. Why don't you come back to Whitetail and teach skiing? And I gave him my tale of woe that I hadn't put on an alpine boot and that kind of thing in, in so long. And uh, he says, "Now, nah, well, why don't you come back? And so I did. I, I went to the local ski shop in Hagerstown, which doesn't exist anymore, by the way, and uh, bought a pair of alpine boots and alpine skis, that kind of thing. And sort of showed up on that first day that he wanted me to show up and they said, oh, good, you're here. Go take this uh, group of instructors out on a clinic. And, uh, oh my God, and I hadn't taught a clinic in eight or nine years at that point. And that uh, got me back into the ski business. Now, for the folks that are, you know, listening to this podcast or watching it, uh, 
in ski teaching, just like many other professions, including uh, whether you're a doctor or whatever, there, there's, there's an organization that's your professional organization. Ski teaching is the Professional Ski Instructors of America. And in, in the United States, there are several divisions. The East is the largest division, by the way, in, in both uh, geography from Maine down to, down to Tennessee. And, and largest also in, uh, in membership. There are about 30,000 members in the whole country sure. in the Professional Ski Instructors of America. And here in the East, there's about uh, 12 or so thousand members. And if you include some of the uh, emeritus folks, around 14,000 total. And there are various levels of certification. Level one, you are certified to certified to teach up through the parallel uh, skiing and your skiing, you know, your, your students would be on uh, steeper and bigger terrain. And then level three is basically teaching everything. And then even above those levels, there are levels of um, what they call it the educational staff. And that includes development team, examiner, training squad, and then full examiner. And each of those levels have tryouts. And so of all of the uh, uh, examiners, the highest level, there are about 62. And uh, I had been an examiner when I got hurt in 1995. And when I came back to ski teaching all those years later, I was zero. I was back to square one. And so I had to go through the process again. I wanted to see how far I could get. And it had never been done uh, to try to make it up through level three and then, you know, get, go through dev team and ETS and, and then examiner training squad is ETS and then full examiner. But uh, long story, even longer, folks, uh, I, I eventually made it and got uh, uh, examiner again, which uh, for me was quite a personal achievement, especially at my age and uh, at, at what I had gone through you, physically. You achieved that at what age, Tom? Well, I'm 65 now, but uh, when, I, when I came back, uh, let's see, I would have been about uh, 53, I think, when I was elevated to full examiner again. And I have been active ever since then. Uh, so th those years of, of uh, ski teaching, um, I've moved from Whitetail, by the way, Ben, the last couple of years, uh, I got uh, lured Our Western away Our to, Western uh, yeah. to, to Wisp out in Garrett County. And, yeah. and, and, and there's a couple of reasons why. One of the reasons is the general manager is my good friend, Ron Ox. And Ron was our ski school director, you know, at Whitetail for those years. And okay, he's a good friend. I was, in, I was in his wedding. I don't know if you know that. Yeah. And he was in my wedding. And we, we have a great friendship. And he had contacted me um, during the summer of 2020 in, in the throes of COVID. And I was, you know, my real life job as assistant secretary of commerce had got him to be on the governor's uh, tourism recovery task force. And uh, so he had, you know, a lot of dialogue back and forth about various work things. And he says, hey, this winter, why don't you come out to Wisp and, and work there? And I said, well, Whitetail's only a few miles from my house. And he says, oh, come on. Okay, I'll entertain it. Anyway, what, I, what happened that winter of 2021 was Whitetail wasn't ready to open yet. You know, it's just, they're a little bit behind. It was a little bit warmer than out in Garrett County where they had already a lot of snow and, and Wisp was already operating. So I agreed uh, that I'll come out on, on, I think it was that first weekend of December since Whitetail wasn't open and I'd help out with some training and that kind of thing. And what happened is I walked into the they do things in ski schools of folks called the instructor training course where new people go through pretty significant training. ITC, so, yeah. Yeah, the ITC. So I, so I walk in and there's good another good friend of mine, Eric Anderson, who's the ski school director at WISP. And he's on crutches. And I said, what are you doing? What happened? He says, oh, I blew my knee out. And he did. He had blown out his ACL a couple of days before. And he says, I'm so glad you're here can you train all these people? Holy cow. So I became a trainer at WISP and uh, would go up all the weekends and, you know, the occasional holiday and sometimes a vacation day and that kind of thing. And 
uh, I've been doing that the last couple of years and working all the PSIA events that, you know, they make me work. You got to put in a minimum number of days, uh, which is usually somewhere around 14 to 16 days a winter for the Professional Ski Instructors of America, plus the weekends that I commit to WISP. Um, so at any rate, that's my, that's my story about uh, ski teaching and, and my comeback from breaking 11 bones and having all those internal injuries. And folks, um, it's just one of those things that uh, I wanted to do it. And it was something that I felt strongly about and it hurt a lot for a long time. And, you know, I still get a lot of twinges and, and Ben, I'll confess to you and whoever watches this, I don't ski the same the way I used to ski before my, my injury, but, uh, I can make pretty decent turns, you know, and, uh, it, it was funny. And in, in 2000, uh, let's see, it would have been 2009, I believe. Yes. Um, I got back in a race course again. And I don't know if you know this, uh, Ben, but the, the, the father of American ski teaching is this guy named Hannes Schneider. And Hannes was an Austrian ski teacher who, who really perfected, kind of invented, but really perfected what was called the Arlberg method, which is a region in Austria. And it includes this thing called the stem and, and uh, you know, stem Christie's and all this kind of thing. Anyway, uh, 1938, uh, he was, you know, a guy in his fifties, I think at the time, it was in Austria, what was called the Anschluss when the Nazis took over uh, the nation of uh, Austria and also part of Czechoslovakia, we know as the Sudetenland. And he disagreed with it very, very publicly and was thrown in prison by the Nazis, even though he was a big star in Austria, I mean, in movies and all kinds of things. And um, there was a, a, a railroad magnate who heard about this and he had, you know, a real interest in, in ski areas on his rail line uh, doing well. So he went over to Austria, this is before America got in the war, paid off the Nazi guards apparently, got Hannes Schneider out of jail with his family, put him on a boat, gets to New York City, puts him on a train, he ends up in North Conway, New Hampshire, and becomes the ski school director at Mount Cranmore, which was the first organized ski school in America, the winter of 38 and 39. True story. And so every year there's this thing called the Hannes Schneider Memorial Cup that they do for certified ski instructors. It's kind of a big deal. And uh, on the 50th anniversary in 1989, uh, I won that race at Whiteface Mountain. And then turn the page to many years after that in 2009, I go back and I attempt it again. It'd be a great story if I could say that I won it. But no, I didn't. I finished second. And awesome. uh, that, that wasn't so bad. No, uh, awesome. and, uh, and of course, then I continued on and became an examiner again. And you know the rest of the story that I already said. But uh, it's been a big part of my life. Uh, my children all ski and snowboard. And uh, my granddaughter, Maddox, who's 10 years old now, is a very good skier. Uh, I don't know if I'll ever see her you know, competing at the level that I once competed at, but uh, it is certainly something that um, a lot of people love. And, uh, you know, it's interesting. COVID might have done the ski business a big favor because our numbers over the years have kind of been going down for the number of skier visits and the number of people taking lessons and that kind of thing. And so people during COVID, during that time when they're stuck at home, we're allowed to do outdoor things, right? And uh, for instance, that winter of 20 and 21 was the busiest year at WISP that, that the ski school had ever had since 1955 when the ski area started. Now think about that. So uh, I was kind of glad that I came to help out. Uh, and then last year was pretty darn busy too. Wasn't quite the same sort of winter as far as snowfall and cold temperatures, but it was still great. And, uh, you know, Ben, I, I appreciate everything that you do working with athlete, athletes and people that are trying to recover uh, from various injuries. And you've been a big help in my life. And uh, so I thank you for everything that you do. It's a very interesting 
podcast. I listened to a few of them, watched a few of them. Uh, don't tell my boss I did it on company time, but anyway, uh, anyway, well, thank you, know, you very much. Uh, for you were, me Tom, guest. you were a mentor to me. Uh, you may remember the Werner sisters and I was helping out with that adaptive sports and yeah. you said, well, why don't you go teach? And I didn't make it the first round. I was, uh, I had a lot of bad habits and I still have a couple that Don Nesmith is trying to iron out and Gerhardt. Uh, we, we do a lot over at, uh, in, in West Virginia now when we, when we'll meet on a Wednesday here and there, but, cool. uh, it was, you know, the, the, what people don't understand, I think about skiing is you do a profession because you have a passion to do a profession and you happen to meet people along the way that you become friend, become friends with. But when you teach at a ski area, you are more of a unit. Uh, and there's nothing quite like it. And you'll make friends that are different sorts of friends, people that you would hang out and have a beer with, as opposed to you're happen to hang out with these doc friends of yours because you're both at the conference and you're friendly with them. And sometimes you make very good friends, but it's a little different with the passion level of skiing because it's something that it's not your career per se. In your case, it was your career, but for many of us, it's a part-time gig. Uh, but it becomes sort of a lifestyle and, and a connection point to uh, to like minds and, um, you know, a, a lifetime of learning the sport. Well, I agree with you. Some of the best people in the world, I think, are skiers and ski teachers because they have a passion that they want to share with a lot of people. And I've met some of the most interesting people over the years, uh, just chit chatting on a chairlift or, you know, any, any number of interactions that you might have. I mean, lawyers, uh, uh, doctors, rocket scientists, true, true, true story. The head of, uh, of uh, Goddard Space Center was on the chairlift with me one time. Uh, I've, I've had ambassadors. I've had all kinds of amazing people. I remember you were it, talking Japanese once. You were, uh, yeah, well, yeah, yeah, yeah. I learned like I bit, know, just three or four, three or four words in, in every language, but, uh, uh, you know, I have, I've had to teach lessons in Spanish and really I only know about 12 words, but, um, it's interesting at both whitetail and wisp, uh, we get a lot of these, um, J one, uh, visa people that, that are there just for like two and a half, three months. They're on their summer break in Argentina or Chile or whatever, or South Africa. And they come to the United States and they end up at, at different ski areas and they teach skiing or they run the chairlifts or whatever that they do. And a lot of them, you know, I've had uh, for, for, you know, they're still friends for years and years and years. Uh, and we stay in touch. Facebook's a wonderful thing that uh, we get to stay in touch with all these people. So well, thank you for letting me be a guest. Yeah, on your yeah, show. No, I, I wanted to tell you from my standpoint, Tom, as um, you know, you being ski director and then going out on personal clinics with you, you know, several times over the years, what I have always enjoyed about your clinics is that you keep it fun. You do have safety first in the back of your mind. Uh, you know, I, I, I remember when you were uh, the director that the culture of the mountain was different than it is now. It's a lot more regulated. Uh, there's a lot more protocols in place, uh, but you ran a good ship. I mean, and, and people love to work under you. I mean, you, you had that gift of having people really want to work hard for you. Uh, well, so. I, th th thank you for saying that. I appreciate that. And, and I think it's people that like doing what they're doing and, and uh, just making sure that they have every bit of advice that they might want uh, uh, to help them out. One of the, one of the th thirsts that all ski teachers have is they want to be better themselves. You brought up Don Nesmith. Uh, I consider him a very good friend and, and, you know, I hired him way back in the day and, uh, I think it was the he's got a racing two. background as well, like you. Yeah, he uh, and he. I think he's got it in him, even though he might be a, a year or two on me. But but I think he's got it in him to someday pass level three, and uh, he's he's coming back from a, I think it was a foot injury or something or an ankle injury, and hopefully he'll get over that and be able to. Uh, you know, do a decent job at that exam. It is a yeah. He had an he had an Achilles tear, and um, I actually um, was part of his care, and and we did some regenerative medicine injections with some uh, placenta tissue, and that helped him along. And uh, but he's uh, 
he's, as you know, uh, a technician like yourself and he sticks to it. And, uh, you know, I expect to be doing a few runs with, with Don this year as well. I got to tell you, there's a, there's a couple interesting things that I wanted to get your take on, uh, from other mountains. And, uh, Maybe it's just how it is sometimes when you're sort of the interloper at the mountain. But I went up to uh, do the uh, the uh, the British invasion up at Killington, and as you know, uh, Carol was up there, and and we we had some people that had uh, formerly taught up at Whitetail, and they they kind of served yeah. as sort of ambassadors. Kinley, Kinley Tanner, and others. Tanner, yeah, yep, yeah. yeah. and. Uh, I enjoyed the program uh, the first couple of years, and then each year it kind of degraded uh, with accommodations. And of course, they don't have the budget, like for instance, that you've been able to uh, help get when um, you know all that effort, like for Two Top. You know, it's just instructors coming to a, an away mountain. Uh, but what I wanted to uh, get your take on is. What is your thought of uh, the situations? And this does happen where. Uh, if you're not kind of the favorite son on the mountain, uh, and it is a little bit of a pet peeve, where you'll have, uh, let's say, some, some of the people in the lesson that have not risen to the abilities to the others that can progress and get up the chair, et cetera, uh, with the group splits, whereby, you know, you'll get the one instructor taking a few aces out while the you know, the masses of the, uh, the students that have not been able to be as proficient are, you know, with a ratio of one to seven, one to eight, one to 10. Uh, that kind of was one thing that soured me on going back. And it was really this one particular uh, instructor that made that decision, you know, wasn't the, the supervisor of the uh, event. But what are your thoughts on that? And I guess, uh, you know, fairness for the students and fairness for the instructors, or you just suck it up and, you know, just say that, you know, that, that happened on that particular uh, uh, situation. Well, uh, one of the things that we got very good at at Whitetail was uh, having students, first of all, be guaranteed that they would learn to ski. And that included riding the chairlift and, you know, doing uh, linked, wedge turns down the hill, that kind of thing. And people learn at different rates. There's no question. Um, and you know this to be true. One of those great things that you do at the beginning of a lesson is you're chit-chatting, you're getting their names, you're finding out if any of them may have skied before. Sometimes that happens that you get a first time beginner lesson and, and yet a couple of them may have skied before. And they're, they're there for whatever reason. They, they didn't do it very well the first time they thought or they wanted to take it as a refresher, whatever, but they were already advanced compared to people that have never done it. And also you do a thing always called teaching for transfer, where you find out if there is a learned skill like ice skating. It's a great activity that there's a lot of similarities with ice skating and, uh, and skiing. You know, you're balancing, you're, you're rolling things uh, over, you know, like you do on skis and there's rotary movement. Long story short, people all learn at a different uh, different uh, pace, and what happens is oftenly, often at a at a at a lesson, the supervisor will make sure that if there are students that are advancing quicker than the rest of the group, you don't want to penalize those students, and you you know move them on maybe with the group to to uh, continue that that trek as you have another instructor work with folks that need a little remedial time, a little bit of extra effort. The way I prefer to do it is to have the best instructor work with the students that need the most help and then have the students that are already getting it, you know, all they really need is more practice time and more mileage. That doesn't necessarily have to be the great instructor, you know, but you do, you know, you find these seniority things that happen in a lot of ski areas, you know, the, the instructors that have been there a long time that maybe are certified or higher up the level, uh, some sort of seniority system, they might end up with the, the so-called easier lesson. Um, you talk with uh, folks like Terry Barber, who's a former member of the uh, U.S. Uh, demo team, and he agrees with me. Have the, have the great instructors work with the people that have the 
that need, need the most help. Yeah, no, I hope I that, that answers the question. Yeah, no, and, that, uh, that did very. You know, I wasn't I wasn't there, but no, but I can, you know, that, I can certainly like see time. what happens. Well, we're in the the almost two minute warning here. What would you like to leave people with in the last you know thirty to forty seconds here, Tom? Um, you know, something to think about. I mean, certainly your story says a lot, and that's why I wanted to have you on. You persevered. You, uh, I think you're an inspiration for anybody that has a really debilitating injury that they can come back. I've had Gary Hall Jr. Uh, on, and he was told yep. he'd never be able to s swim competitively. And, and he went, won several gold medals after that. So, I mean, that to me was, was a big deal. And I, I, I get goosebumps hearing about your story too. And, and especially, you know, you had to be thinking at one moment when you came to, I don't know if you were knocked out for a few seconds, Am I going to make it? Period. You know. Oh, I was talked. I was. Yeah, it, it, that was going on in my mind. And to to close, you know, find something that you love doing and get paid doing it. And that's you know, tell your kids that. Uh, you know, that you have a daughter. I think that's a great artist. And 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 if she loves doing that, figure out a way that she can get paid doing it. Absolutely, and, Tom. Uh, Tom, thank you so much for doing this, man. And we'll, uh, we'll be joining, hopefully in the future, some other skiers and we're gonna have some other stuff. We're gonna, uh, I'll get this out to you, Tom. So you'll have it for, uh, to show people. And, you know, really, I'm, I'm glad we archived your story because it's an important one, Tom. Well, thank you very much. 